I'm Donna Payer. I'm Chair of Computational and Systems Biology at the uh, Sloan uh, Kettering Institute and also direct the uh, Single Cell Research Initiative and the uh, Center for Tumor Ecosystems and Metastasis. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, single cell RNA-seq since this is uh, your first talk about this and not many people know it and it's by now a pretty mature and packed field. Likewise, the talk is going to be a packed talk not the most recent things, but I want to give people a flavor. So rather than give a tutorial where everyone will follow me and understand me and think I'm a half-decent teacher, I'm going to jump around and try and give you a flavor and a feel for this data. Uh, hopefully so you'll, you'll, you'll know what to think about. So it's more food for thought rather than, than real teaching, but there's just a lot of food for thought in this field. And if you're going to encounter this data, if you have to analyze this data, yourself or see papers about this data, I'm hoping uh, that you'll be able to, to gain something from this uh, uh, tutorial research talk, more tutorial actually. <laughs> so really the game changer for single cell RNA-seq came uh, when you had this sort of microfluidic ability to look at single cell RNA-seq. In this microfluidics you have these little droplets, the, there's different microfluidic devices but the best ones are droplet based. So you have a little drop, a, a tiny drop um, inside an oil emulsion, this is a drop, and inside the drop you have a bead, and we'll talk about what the bead has, and a cell. And I'll show you a little animation of what this looks like. So you can see here everything comes in, let's see when the cell comes in, they're so tiny you can barely see them. Uh, here's a tiny cell coming in. And so you have these beads coming in, cells coming in, and all the enzymes coming in, and then they get encapsulated and sealed. So in each uh, such emulsion, what you have is a bead, a single cell, and uh, some enzymes. The enzymes burst the cell apart, so now the cell's contents get gutted out, and then you have uh, special primers for reverse transcriptase. And in these special primers, there, there are two barcodes. The first barcode is the cell barcode. It basically is, is different in each one of these drops. So each one of these little squishy beads has a different sequence, and that's the cell barcode. That gets added on to the transcripts when it's reverse transcriptase. So now each transcript has its cell identity. An additional little piece is the uh, UMI, uh, the Unique mole Molecular Identifier. It's a random uh, k-mer of sequences that also gets added on. And this one allows you to go back to the identity of the molecule. So after amplification, if you have some exponential amplification and you see many, many copies of the molecule, you'll be able to look at the UMI and go back and say, oh yeah, I've just seen 40 copies of this, but it actually comes from one molecule, so I can count it as one. All this thing gets to be packed up in this, this, you know, this, uh, in, into this commercial 10x device. And this commercial 10x device is almost like a CD player. It's uh, pretty easy to run as long as you know how to handle your cells properly. And it's turned the, the problem from a problem of technology uh, to a problem of uh, computation. So this is now our world. It's easy to generate this data. It's terribly hard to analyze this data. And this data, while we've made some progress in understanding, particularly all the muck and the guck in this data, it still has plenty of room for, for, for computational solutions. We're very, very far from where we need to be. So first of all, I know a lot of you look at bulk. So the first thing to think about when you, you think about single cell RNA-seq is that you do not get full transcriptomes of single cells. You can treat single cell RNA-seq as this reverse transcriptase that's like a random processing thing. So it will pick up, particularly in these high throughput droplet-based technologies, three, four, five percent of the transcripts. So you can view the cell as this huge bag of, you know, 200,000, 100,000 transcripts, and in comes the reverse transcriptase, and, you know, grabs a small fraction of them, let's say four percent of them. So while in bulk you get all these numbers, because in bulk you've, you've just squished together about a million cells, single cell RNA-seq is a matrix full of zeros. Some of these zeros is because, well, we have 20,000 genes and most cells don't express most genes. And some of the zeros are simply because we didn't capture that transcript. We we're only sampling from the cell. So when you zoom into this row of zeros and you look at, at data and you say, huh, these are all CD3 uh, 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 T cells. All of them should be expressing CD3. but you know, not all of them express CD3, 
Likewise, for every other molecule, uh, it has a couple copies of it. And due to the fact that we are only sampling a few of them, often we will get zero of them. So while the cell is expressing that marker, and while that marker might be a critical marker for that cell's identity and function, since we're only sampling a few of them, we don't know, uh, you know how, to, how to treat that. So it's very difficult uh, to, to interpret this. So some people say, well, if, since it's so sparse, since you pick up so few uh, molecules, since it's so hard to interpret, why even do this? Why not go back to the bulk that people are used to, the people uh, that you do get all the molecules, that you do capture everything that you expect? Remember, one can think of it as you are getting more information. In bulk, you also don't get all the transcript. You're also sampling the transcripts across many, many cells. And you don't even know what cell it came from. You have a, a, a mixture and a blender. Here you have at least gotten additional information. You've gotten for each information which cell it came with. And then you can do lots of computation using that additional information. And even though the data is so sparse, we're able to get a lot of biology. Again, I'm trying to focus on the methods, so I won't be able to show you how rich the biology is, but I will say that it has been transformative across almost every field of biomedicine, and the ability to discover if you analyze this data properly is, is enormous. So we have uh, this dropout data, so we don't know what cells are. If we look at them naively, we have to be a little bit smarter. In addition, not only do we have a very sparse data matrix, if sparsity was our only problem, I would be happy, we have a very a dirty, uh, uh, messy uh, data matrix. So there is a lot of enzymes involved. And not only are there a lot of enzymes involved and multiple rounds of exponential amplification, in order to make this work, we have a lot of barcodes. We have the cell <laughs> barcodes, and we have these UMIs. So in addition to the regular transcripts, we have a lot of sort of barcode-based sequences and a lot of primers and a lot of junk in the mix. Now, if you put enzymes into a mix with lots of primers and lots of sequences, you know, you have your little what I expect, but enzymes are actually very creative beasts, and they can do some very strange thing. And this process is very error prone. Particularly PCR is one of the most error prone uh, processes, and because we're starting with so little material, we amplify it multiple times. Exponential amplification, so a little a pile of error, or as my students like to call it, a little pile of shit, uh, turns into a big pile of shit. Um, this is a lot of errors. For example, there's particularly a lot of errors, both in the UMIs and the barcodes. So you can't do like exact matching uh, if you actually try and count UMIs exactly and not take into account that there are plenty of errors once someone counted uh, something like 4,000 copies of a transcript that were all multiple errors of the same molecule one hamming distance away that was just amplified out the wazoo. So you have to be careful. Uh, there are errors, and you need to do some error correction, both on the UMIs and on the cell barcode if you want half-decent data. Now, in a droplet-based technologies, you don't even know uh, what barcodes relate to cells. If you noticed the little video before, a cell entered only about one in seven uh, droplets. So there were six empty droplets. Now these empty droplets, they have primers, they have enzymes, they have everything. And you know, you have a lot of stuff floating around. There is uh, ambient RNA. Generally speaking, cells don't like anything you do to them. You take the cells, you disassociate them, you mix them, you prod them, you poke them. Cells become very unhappy, particularly when they're disassociated. And cells that are unhappy begin dying and squirting out their RNA into the media. And this RNA squirted into the media enters all these empty droplets and uh, makes it really, really hard to distinguish between a cell and not. So if you just count, let's say you put in 3,000 cells into the device and you count how many barcodes do I have with a decent amount of transcripts, you'll get 200,000 out of a typical 10x run. And this is what the distribution looks like. So now you have to decide which barcodes are cells and which one aren't. And I can tell you that to this date, there is no good answer. These are definitely ambient almost, and these are definitely cells. But what about the middle? 
You can try and model this through all sorts of Gaussians and all sorts of things. The problem is that cells are very different. You can have this big, juicy RNA factory like a fibroblast. A fibroblast will have 500,000 transcripts in it. So it's going to be a big cell, and you're going to capture it as a big cell. A naive T cell only has 4,000 transcripts. If you only have 4,000 transcripts to begin with, where do you think you're going to be uh, in this uh, thing? You're certainly not going to be here with you know, 3,500 transcripts. And so because there's such big differences in cell size, as well as big differences in enzymatic efficiency. For example, that process of breaking the cell open somehow tends to be a little bit different in every droplet. So some cells are effectively burst open, and some cells are only shaking up a little bit. Again, so in order to decide which cell is real and which cell isn't real um, is a really hard problem. We do whatever we can do to sort of move forward and give a bad heuristic and move forward, but that one uh, isn't well solved. And not only don't we have a really good way to distinguish between cells to non-cells, and we typically uh, err on the side of chucking out uh, a lot of really good cells. And I found that, for example, the typical uh, 10x cell ranger pipeline throws out many rare, interesting cell types, this entire cell type, because they're pretty small. But remember I was telling you about that RNA that gets you know, poured into the media? If you think it's only affecting empty drops, then you know, you're a little bit delusional. So each and every one of your real cell is also contaminated with this crap. And right now, only now are emerging some solutions on how to try and remove crap uh, from this data. So the bottom line is this data is very noisy. It's very sparse. And before I summarize all the problems with this data, just to get you really excited about looking at it, uh, I want to sort of uh, raise the fact that dropout affects all genes. So there's a lot of publications out there with zero inflation, particularly in the C zero si uh, uh, computer science field. And someone says, oh, they modeled it with zero inflation. So will I. And so now there's a complete proliferation of zero inflation modeling for single cell RNA-seq data. That is wrong. Remember, our model, or what's really happening, is that the, trans, you know, the, the RNA polymerase doesn't you know, decide whether it's going to take all the transcripts of a gene, yes or no. It just randomly chooses transcripts. Of course, if there's more of a particular transcript, there's more of a chance that it will be non-zero. But it's actually it can be viewed as a sandblaster. So zero inflation basically sort of flips a coin. Am I going to see this gene or not? A and that's you know, simply wrong and doesn't capture the, the, the binomial distribution of the data, which is basically you are randomly sampling uh, the transcripts from your bag of transcripts. And if you want to model this data, please don't follow the, uh, some of the literature examples of zero inflation. That works sort of well for fluidine data because of all sorts of technological reasons. But once we've moved out of fluidine data into the different droplet-based technologies, 10x being the most prevalent one, but any one of the mi big microfluidic technologies, 10x, Sequel, Indrops, Dropseq, uh, all are uh, um, binomial in their uh, dropout. So to summarize, we don't know what zero means. There's uh, very sparse data. There's lots of errors, lots of ambient RNA. OK, that really calls for statisticians to come and begin cleaning this data up. Right now, people are doing some pretty shitty uh, attempts to clean up the data to get something that's not horrific and move forward and try and analyze it because there's so much good biology. So what is our modeling framework here? Our modeling framework is that single cell RNA-seq measures a phenotype. So we can treat the, the expression of each gene as a, as a, as a vector, uh, each cell as a vector, each uh, entry in the vector is the expression of a gene, and therefore you know, we have a, pheno, you know, a point in high dimensional space, 20,000 dimensional space if you want to look at all the genes, and basically if we get a data set, <laughs> This data set is a distribution of cells. So again, we sort of put the, space in the, the cell in high dimensional space based on its expression in whatever 20,000 dimensional space you're sort of comfortable in working in. And now we have a distribution of all the observed phenotypes. And our, real, our goal is to really, to, to first of all, characterize and understand uh, this distribution. 
And, and most of the work today, really, I mean, there's some work on revealing mechanism for single cell RNA-seq data, and single cell RNA-seq data is really great for mechanism because, you know, in the you know, in genomics days, you get 500 samples, 1,000 samples, you're happy. And this is sort of the RNA-seq people. Here you can get 100,000 samples. You can actually sort of do learning for, for regulation and, and relationships. But really most of the work is, is, is focused on sort of modeling this phenotypic space or the space where you observe cell phenotypes, the space where you observe combinations of uh, genes being expressed. So first thing, you know, some of you people are really, really smart, but I'm not, and I don't really like thinking in 20,000 dimensions. Um, I like thinking in two and three. And therefore, what, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, and, and we like to visualize. So we saw a lot of PCA here, and PCA is really great when your relationships are linear. What you see here is every single dot is a cell, and they're color-coded by the cell type. And you see that PCA doesn't do a really good job at distinguishing between the different immune cell types. That's because phenotypic space is not uh, linear. And so, oh, I did the wrong one. How do I get this uh, back? Yeah, I pressed on the one I was told not to press because it's very natural to press there. <laughs> ah. Oh. Or I'll just move to where I want to be. Uh, or, yeah, I need to remember to press the right one or not move my finger from there or something. It's just so natural to press the, 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 the do not explode this thing button. <laughs> no, I did not press it this time. It's, now it's just not behaving. Okay, now I'm, I'm, my, finger, my thumb's on the right button. And so now we, we switch to no, uh, nonlinear dimensionality. So everyone's talking about T-SNE, T-SNE, T-SNE. T-SNE is a nonlinear uh, reduction technique, uh, the first one that was shown to work well for this data. Basically, there's no meaning for the axes. And people like to draw T-SNE axis 1 and T-SNE axis 2. There's no meaning. Basically, it does the best job it can to try and map 20,000 dimensions to 2. And it works on pairwise different distances. So cells that are really nearby uh, in the low dimensional manifold are probably really similar in the high dimension. And cells that are uh, more far away are probably more distant. Of course, you can't keep all distance relations from 20,000 dimensions <laughs> to two. So it's really, really warped. And of course, the, the optimization is based on pairwise distances. Therefore, there's no meaning for the axes. And the final warning is really don't put too much into this image. So you are going to alter your data. This is a non-perfect thing. So if you're going to try and interpret things and tell grandma tales off the 2D uh, plot that you see, whether it's T-SNE, there's a couple other methods now, UMAP, force directed layouts, any method is going to, to mess it up. And so you can conjecture things. You can use the visualization to say, oh, I think I see something interesting, but always go back to the high dimension to see if what you see in two dimension holds when you're looking at the data and, and, and measuring and validating every uh, story you want to tell back to the high dimensional data. So this is the same data as before with T-SNE. And you see that T-SNE really successfully separates the major immune cell types into these separate clouds. One of the reasons that T-SNE works is it's one of the first dimensionality reduction methods that is able to work with multiple uh, manifolds. And just to show you that the data is really like a manifold, now we're going to see the exact same data as three dimension. And what you see is that cell phenotypes really do take on, you know, very, very distinct, very, very well-formed um, shapes. If you take different healthy immune systems, you'll get the same shapes. The data will look more or less the same. And what you can notice from this is if you want to model this as nice, pretty, convex Gaussian balls, you're going to fail. And the data is really uh, you know, not, not, not organized, not Gaussian, not convex, and not linear. And you should take that into account. And therefore, all these nice methods that we like, uh, so you're sort of like based on pretty well-behaved Gaussians, are going to fail miserably in single cell data. The second big, um, so that's sort of the hard, the down point. You know, we can't uh, use all our nice little Gaussian tools that we like. 
the other real cool feature, or, you know, I sort of gave you a lot of bad things about single cell data and probably convinced every one of you why is this crazy woman so excited about this data. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit why I'm so excited. Really, one of the really exciting things is actually from single cell data, we see that actually cell phenotypes are continuous. And we have no single cell resolution to take cells and order them in, in a continuous way. So a lot of single cell data is asynchronous. For example, right now, each and every one of us in our bone marrow has uh, uh, regeneration going on. So if we take a bone marrow sample from any one of us, it will be painful, but you will get the hematopoietic stem cell. You will get uh, uh, all the different uh, myeloid populations that it generates. You will get the immature lymphoids and every single population along the way, and you will get the full gamut of hematopoiesis from a single sample. So you can actually get dynamics, you can get transitions, you can get development, you can get a full time course from one single sample, which you can you know, collect often as, as many as 5,000 cells. And so one of the big uh, challenges in the field is now take these individual cells that have been separated and, and unordered, and now order them along a, a, a pseudo time um, that basically recapitulates their development and you can take it step by step by step and understand all the intermediate transitions, all the branch points, all the places where a cell decides to become a dendritic cell or a myeloid or a lymphoid and that's in hematopoiesis but you can do the same thing for anything, any developmental system, lung development, gut development, anything you really want to do. And really the key assumption is we have this asynchronous data where we have all the different cell types and, and all the intermediates in the data. And this, this data continuously and gradually changes. So if we see very similar cells in their gene expression, they are probably also very similar in their um, uh, developmental time course. And really, I mean, this, 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 this developmental, this continuous nature of the da data, particularly development, is really, really strong. And so even principal component analysis actually can get something that sort of resembles uh, development and that's led to a proliferation of, uh, of pseudo time methods. Um, some of them better than others, many of them quite crappy. Um, but there are quite a few good ones out there too. And again, there's no one best method because different cell systems, different biologies have very different features, very different distributions. And so one method that might be perfect for hematopoiesis won't be that great for the gut. One um, method that will be good for regenerating systems won't be good for embryonic developmental systems. Biology matters. You don't have a one size fits all super uh, built silver bullet. But let's look a little bit at some features and some of these features are shared. So these green cells are actually B cells and you can really see I sort of drew the developmental trajectory through it and the cells sort of really develop this way. And as you can see, sort of my, my, my uh, claim of nonlinearity, this, this stuff is really nonlinear. And if we go to two dimensions, what we really see is markers rise and fall in, 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 in development. In case of B cells, CD10 rises and then CD10 goes down. And so if you have very noisy data, because I told you the data is noisy, and you see two similar cells, you don't know if, for example, uh, the distance between these two cells is because CD10 has gone up or CD10 has already gone down here. And so one of the ways to overcome this, and one of the really most powerful tools uh, to analyze single cell data, is, is graphs. So graphs are a wonderful thing, and they've been really instrumental in actually organizing and analyzing single cell data. Here, every cell in the graph, every node in the graph represents a cell, and you connect every cell to its most similar cells. And depending on the data and the algorithm and the goal, and the key to success is how you construct this matrix and this graph, which can be a matrix as well. And really, there are different ways to do this graph construction. But if you construct a good graph, if you're doing something uh, reasonable in your graph construction, then you can really go through the, 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 the phenotypic landscape. So you don't make big Euclidean steps that sort of cross outside of phenotypic landscape and sort of take a big step where cells don't seem to be able to do. And you basically decide distances between cells 
and you sort of traverse this graph through little steps of very, very similar cells. And if you have very, very similar cells, you know you're in the cell density, you know you're, you're doing good things. And this is a way to, for, for example, try and get pseudo time and other measurements uh, of, of the sort of phenotypic manifold in cell space. So really, just to repeat this, because I think this is if you sort of get one thing out of this lecture, it's really, it's really good to represent cell phenotypic space in single cell data, both a single cell RNA-seq and single cell ATAC-seq as a graph. And then if you want to do uh, any type of analysis of this data, you traverse uh, through this uh, graph, uh, taking little steps between similar cells. And sort of local cells allow you to really infer a lot about the, the, the general structure of the data. And another really great advantage of graph structures is their dimensionalists. So you go from 20,000 dimensions, and to estimate dimensionality in high dimensions is horrible. It is uh, computationally heavy. It is statistically unstable. So once you go from this high dimensional space where any type of density and geometrical uh, um, estimation is horrible to this sort of nice, friendly, dimensional structure, um, then you have robustness, you lose dimensionality, and um, computation is pretty uh, easy. Every cell is connected to its most similar cells. You know, here's just one example where we use it in B cells, and we could actually order the cells and pick up very rare cell populations which do very important things that are as little as one, as seven in 10,000 and three in 10,000 cells. We could discover new biologies. And by ordering the cells along this pseudo time and seeing what they do, so one of the advantages is once you sort of order cells along pseudo time and give each cell its sort of ordering and, 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 and sort of identity along pseudo time, then you can try and see, okay, what do cells do as they develop? What do cells do as they transition from one cell type to another? You can take a sliding window and look at any trait you want. Uh, this example right here is a sliding window over behavior of markers or genes. So you could look at how genes change, how relationships between genes change. Uh, you can take signatures, you could take processes, and basically you can go along pseudo time, take a sliding window, compute whatever property you want and see how it changes along your pseudo time, your developmental path. And this allowed us to, to really recognize some rare populations along the way that do really interesting things, which we could then identify and, and validate. Of course, you could do that only again if you build a good graph and develop a good algorithm and also clean your data up from all the noise. So the graph gives you transitions, but it also gives you stable populations. So if you look at the graph structure, what you see often are these clicks, these really, really dense regions with lots of sort of uh, messy interconnectedness, and then these sparser uh, connections between them. And this really gives you a separation of data from this you know, gradual uh, continuum <laughs> transitions or a continuum and these uh, sort of stable cell states where these are actually the cell types that biologists have uh, defined before. Of course, to get these methods to work, you need good feature selection. What genes are you going to focus on? For, all, for example, ribosomal uh, genes are really, really a very dominant signal that sometimes overpowers your, really bi your biology. So often since, unless you're really into studying the biology of the ribosome, since it's such a big module of so many uh, genes, a uh, couple of, I think, 2,000, and they're very highly expressed. They're going to dominate your signal. So if you want to pick up more subtle signal, simply take them and check them out of your data, and you'll reveal more subtle structure. So feature selection, good similarity metrics, good co uh, graph construction methods really make the difference between getting to the biology or not. So again, to pick up the clusters, I said there's these dense regions, so we can hijack methods uh, from, from social networks. You know, tell if, uh, I, and basically, you know, tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. Here, a wonderful way to get uh, a good graph construction is the Jacquard method. The, da the data, if you just look at most nearest cells because of the high degree of noise, might not give you a very modular graph. 
But if you use any similarity metric on the sun, build your graph, and then take a se second step using a Jacquard method and say, how many neighbors do we share, and use that as your similarity metric, that gives you a very modular graph, which different community detection methods using some modularity optimization scores can pick up. And that really is very, very effective at very, very robustly identifying cell types, at least as far as, as known biology. So this is great. We went into some things you can do. Now let's go back into the guck. So when you're working with a single sample and you work with these graph-based methods, life is good. And then you throw a couple samples into the mix. Here we have a tumor infiltrating immune cells from four different tumors. And this is the first uh, tumor data ever collected from human tumor clinical samples. And the first thing that one notices is that the tumor immune systems of each uh, tumor, these are breast cancers, are very different. Here's a region of myeloids that have very high inflammation. Uh, we have another region of T cells that are high in hypoxia. Completely different tumor immune cells. Well, is it uh, real or is it artifact? There's actually an incredible amount of batch effects in this data. So we decided to see if we can actually clean up the batch effects. And normalization is actually today the biggest unsolved problem in, in single-cell RNA-seq. So if you're a really good computational person, have very strong ML and statistical skills, and want to have huge impact, fix normalization. Here is, you know, for those of you who are at the retreat, we use some Bayesian modeling. We try and say, OK, what we have here is a mixture of populations. Each cell is from one of these mixture of uh, log normal Gaussians. Uh, we actually want to capture uh, the, 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 the multivariate relations, because actually multivariate relations are what really define cells. So we can build a plate model doing a, an incredible amount of inference. The only observed model in this plate model is this little poor thing right here. And we have to infer all this monstrosity. Uh, <laughs> start with very good priors, and you can succeed. Uh, you can do this using Gibbs sampling, which we learned this morning. Uh, it works really well and really accurately if you don't have too many cells and you have a lot of patients. Or uh, we learned some variational inference for those of us at the retreat. Uh, a, there's a much quicker model to do variational inference. And uh, this very same data, once you carefully model it and clean up the batch and, and use this model, you could see this is, again, the same data. Now all cells are well mixed, and we could take the neighbor graph and look at the entropy of its nearest neighbors to say, is it well mixed or not across samples? You can see here that the entropy was really low before. The entropy is well mixed afterwards, and the data has much, much more structure. And again, if you're not careful with your normalization, and you try and look at cohorts, and I know that you guys are all uh, stat gen people, you love cohorts, you're not going to do any analysis on a single person. So if you're ever looking at a cohort, the first thing you want to do is stop and make sure you normalize your data well. Um, Graph-based normalization, oh, shh, I did it again. Uh, how do, and show, okay, start show again. Remember not to take my thumb off again. Uh-huh. So graph-based methods are great um, for this thing. So here is uh, before normalization. The cell types of the same color are supposed to be the same cell types. This is MNN correct. Uh, done by John Marioni. It's currently the most widely used method. It's really fast and works really well if the assumptions are correct. MNN correct assumes that all the samples are the same. It assumes that all the samples have the same populations, that you don't have new populations, that you don't have altered populations. So if you try and run MNN correct when you have new populations, when you have changes in your population structure, it is going to force them and it is going to squish them. Here is a developmental time course. It's supposed to go this way from day three to um, day 8.5. It's supposed to do that, developing a spatial axis as well. And MNN correct, which is, as I said, the best method when you can make the assumption that the samples are similar, just forces these things into a squish. And you need to develop uh, methods 
that uh, can actually take into account the assumption. So again, with single cell RNA-seq data, I mean, people love bake-offs. The problem is that the data is so varied. The statistical properties of these different distributions of cell phenotypic space vary so much across systems, across biological questions, that there's no one size fits all, which means there's a lot of place for all of us to develop many, many methods for many, many years, which is why you should join this field. Uh, how much more time do you want me to lecture? Because I have a lot more material, but I assume that I won't go through all of it. Five minutes. Five minutes. OK. So again, um, switching from graphs to matrices, one of the great things about having a graph is with this graph, you can actually turn this graph uh, into a matrix. So you take the neighborhood graph, you build a similarity ma uh, matrix where each two um, cells are, are, are sort of, the entry is the sort of similarity between each pair of cells. Uh, you could take some kernel, some like, for example, Gaussian kernel, and turn the similarity uh, or, or the distance metric into a similarity metric, and we take a distance and turn it into a similarity metric. Now you have a similarity metric, where each uh, ij is the similarity between cells ij, and, and this is great. You can sort of turn it into a Markov matrix by, by normalizing it, making sure all the rows and, and things sum, and now you have a, a transition metric. So you sort of, um, you know, now, now you have a little Markov process where each entry in the matrix is the probability of going from cell I to cell J in one step. And now that you have this matrix, you can actually use all sorts of spectral methods to study the structure of this matrix. So another real nice thing about graphs is you can actually turn these graphs into matrices and then you have an entire theory. And specifically the eigen um, vectors of this matrix really give a lot of insight into the structure of the data. So these are called diffusion components. And uh, really, the, the diffusion components define the structures of uh, variation in the data. So here is sort of a toy Swiss roll. And you can see the, 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 the first diffusion component really sort of captures that big Swissy roundy swirl. The second diffusion component, uh, or eigenvector of that matrix, sort of captures the sort of width of the Swiss roll. And these diffusion components also really well capture the general axes of the biggest biological trends in the data. So here we have uh, uh, T-cell developmental data and the diffusion components, the first diffusion component really captures the, the developmental tra uh, trajectory. So what we have is we have these diffusion components which we can get out of the transition metrics that really give us new axes for this high dimensional space. And now we could take these 20,000 dimensions, we can lower them to manifolds that have much less dimensions, often only as many as 10. And then we could look at the fusion components as the biggest nonlinear axes of variation in our data. And usually there's some very interesting biology happening along these components. Again, to compare, PCA just gives us the biggest um, sort of linear variation of component. It's completely outside of our manifold, but the fusion maps will give us the biggest direction of variation in our data, twisting and turning along within our manifold, assuming that we have something embedded in high dimensional space. And this is really, really powerful, again, to study the variation, the major trends and the major biology in, in our data. So for example, earlier I showed you that we can cluster T cells. And yes, a T cell is very different than a macrophage or an epithelial cell. But even within the T cells, the T cells aren't just one big shapeless blob. The T cells, the immune data that I showed you earlier that I had to normalize with biscuit so I won't get horrible, unnormalized um, artifact crap, it actually it is organized along continuums, continuums of activation, how activated the T cell is and actively into sort of killing the tumor. Um, and once you get too activated, then there's another axis of you get exhausted and hypoxia. So those are the three biggest trends. And there's more trends. There's about uh, nine different trends, many of them metabolic. So actually, you can actually get new component systems with this diffusion maps, find sort of these continual gradients on your data that really capture the major trends of your data. And then again, using something like a sliding window or something smarter than that, uh, really uh, dig into the biology of your data. And I think uh, we are now going to call it uh, stops. Um, yeah, I know I put way too much, but just for fun, in case. 
ah, I knew I wasn't going to go through all, but uh, there. Of course, uh, we have positions as well, not only postdoc positions, but faculty positions and uh, acknowledgments. <laughs>